I'm introducing Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Okay. So thanks very much, Julian and Casey, for organizing this day. It uh, seems like it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's been a lot so far. Um, so I'm Michelle. I'm Michelle Paris. Uh, I come from the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto, where I'm sessional faculty in material art and design, and also I run uh, the Mobile Experience Innovation Center. So. There's a couple of things that I want to touch upon um, in this talk. First of all, uh, I'm really interested in archetypes and history and historical precedents around mobile media. So I'll talk a little bit about that and how that relates to storytelling, um, you know, using uh, geospatial media specifically and how it is embedded with landscape, and also some of the work that's going on at OCAD and the MEIC right now. So uh, Bill Buxton, who's also a colleague at OCAD, um, really great sort of sort of line to sort of frame of what I'll be talking about. Uh, the only way to engineer the future is to have lived in it yesterday. And I'm going to start off with a series of stories. Um, and the first one is about my grandmother. So my grandmother was born in Lintlaw, Saskatchewan, um, which is a really tiny farming community in the southeastern corner of uh, the province. And she was born in the early 1930s. Um, and as you can see, like there's really, there's a whole lot of farming. There's not really a whole lot of anything else um, around there. And uh, when she was born, it was both the height of the Great Depression as well as the height of the Great Drought. Um, so, you know, this basically pushed uh, farming communities and farmers in particular further and further into poverty. Um, but one of the things that she tells me about this time was not so much about how difficult it was, but more so about bay leaf. And, you know, you have a small community of people, luxuries were really hard to come by, um, and community meant a lot to people. So there was a bay leaf that would essentially be taken from house to house. Um, and this is the, you know, her telling me about her mother going and she would accompany her mother with this bay leaf and they would share the bay leaf throughout the community. So you would cook with it, you, when you were finished with it, you would go and you would deliver it to somebody else's house. And this leaf, um, this sort of you know, small lo-fi technology acted as a vehicle for communications to enable you know, getting updates in terms of what was going on with, um, you know, what's the price of grain doing, what's happening in the town, what's happening in the country. This is also before World War II, so political situation gets heightened. And as a German immigrant, um, you know, you want to be kept up to speed in terms of what's happening. Um, and uh, it's a portable facilitation um, of, of communication. Um, so that's the first story. Um, this is the building that I work in, uh, in Toronto. Um, I guess I could talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about the MEIC and OCAD in a bit, um, but this is our tabletop. And as a bit of background, um, this is where I come from. So my background is in material culture and craft, and I uh, have a practicing jewelry studio that I've been working on for about 10 years. Um, and about five years ago, I started moving away from uh, just the sort of physical artifacts into um, the digital. And so this is an Easter egg project, uh, rather crappy photo that I can see now, um, but of a QR code Easter egg hunt that we did earlier in the year. And so when I talk about stories, what do stories help us do? They help us to organize um, our spatial practices. They help us to organize our relationships between who we are and where we come from and where we're going. So this is um, a miniature uh, from a manuscript that was done in the 1500s, um, and it's Persian. It's from the Haft al-Rang, which is the name of it. Um, and these uh, miniatures, um, there's several folios. This one tells the story, sort of a you know, prototypical story. Boy meets girl. Boy wants to be with girl. Girl's parents say, no way. Um, take girl away. He goes after girl, et cetera, sometimes to tragic ends. Um, but the interesting thing about this is, uh, is the notion of um, nomadic culture and the portability of objects that communicate embedded technologies, social and historical structures, economic systems, et cetera. And I'm particularly interested in the carpets. So you can see like this little sort of coalesced eruption that happens on the plains um, as they make their encampment are all using textiles. And these textiles are embedded with um, you know, the iconography um, of the landscape, of architecture, etc. cetera. Um, but there's also the sort of ancillary, sorry, whack that. Um, also the ancillary systems um, of 
of the society that also go along with it, and that includes things like agrarian society, um, you know, agrarian uh, or animal husbandry rather, um, in terms of being able to keep the goats that would then be used for the cashmere or the the sheep that would be used for the the wool, the dyeing, so there's organic chemistry, etc. And what I find really interesting is how. The literacy, um, how you, you gain a literacy to understand sort of what the backstory is behind all of these and how that sets a precedent for when we design objects now. Um, how much information do you want to be giving and how much information do you, uh, are you able to give and how much information do we really want? So this is my last slide of carpets, I swear. Um, this is the Pazirik rug and what I find you know, it's, it's sort of a historical um, or a, a sort of rather important piece because it's um, the oldest known carpet fragment in the world. It's 2,500 years old, and textiles normally don't last that long. It was found um, in a burial tomb, you know, layered between ice. So this is how it survived. Um, it was made in Persepolis uh, in Iran, or during the Iranian em Empire. And um, you can see some of the iconography around the bottom. There's um, mounted riders, and those represent the guards um, of the palace in Persepolis. Um, there's elks and deer that sort of go in the interior band, and those represent the relationship to nature, and there's also masculinity, there's architectural references, etc. And so it's not only, you know, fascinating to talk about the, how this references um, the technological innovation, but it's also the fact that this was made in Persepolis, but it was found when it was discovered, um, it was found in a tomb um, in the Altai Mountains, which are 4,000 kilometers away. And so this is sort of like, um, I guess, you know, northern Mongolia, uh, southern Siberia. Um, and so when we talk about the transfer of knowledge and how historically there's historical precedents that come, you know, before us, um, it's indicative of the cultural, you know, economic, technical systems, et cetera, and how that information spreads throughout the world. Um, so this is also from the same part of the world. And this is the Kokcha Valley um, in northeastern Afghanistan in Badakhshan province. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because just um, over sort of down the river a little bit and uh, past those hills is a mine called the Sar Isang mine. And the fascinating piece about, or the fascinating thing about this mine is that it has been in continuous production um, of lapis lazuli, which is a semi precious blue gemstone, for 6,500 years. So this is the mine that supplied Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, um, you know, ancient Rome, the Iranian empires with a resource in which they could create their cultural goods. And when I think about this in terms of artifact, um, there are artifacts that are, you know, help us to understand where this fits in terms of where we come from as human beings and across our human evolution and our continuity. But it also makes me think of what is it in 7,000 years that we're creating now that people will be able to look back and say, oh, by the way, this is what they were doing then, and this is indicative of what their culture was about. And so what do we communicate to the future, essentially? Especially when um, a lot of our artifacts are becoming digital. So does, has anybody seen this before? A couple people? OK, great. Um, so this is actually a map. Um, and this was created by the Greenland Inuit, and they go back about 300 years. This particular piece um, was given to Danish explorers, um, you know, when they were first starting to, you know, settle or well, try to attempt to settle rather Greenland. Um, and the Danish explorers looked at this and they were like, "What the heck is this? How do I use this? I have no idea how to interface, like how this interface works, how this thing, like, what's the usability on this?" And it's um, an abstract representation representation of geospatial environments and this was used by holding it under your mitten and running your fingers up and down the side and those all of those grooves and notches represent coastlines um, you know heights of cliffs and islands and so tactile and tangible um, you know is representations of physical geography and also thinking about different ways of locating oneself um, in the environment that's not necessarily visual and also how like, you know, we're physical beings, we can't deny that, like, we somehow have this, this thing about, um, you know, trying to negotiate ourselves out of nature and, uh, or out of the natural environment or the physical environment at times, and this kind of demonstrates how we're intrinsically and inherently tied to it. And also how increasingly complicated it is to, you know, especially with, with the advent of digital technology, computer science, so it's difficult enough to embed these objects with just our cultural knowledge, but then also the layers of science and technology that go behind them. How do we communicate what it is that we're trying to do? So um, this is Ursula Franklin. 
Uh, she's a Canadian-German immigrant um, who works at the University of Toronto, and she gave a talk in 1989 um, called the Massey Lectures, and they were then uh, published into a book called The Real World of Technology, which is a really great, great uh, read if you can pick it up. And one of the things that I'm really interested in around digital artifacts and how we interact with our environment is how this, our sense of history and identity that's present in every civilization is rooted in a common knowledge of past events. And one of the things that I find incredible about um, you know, practices, whether it's geospatial media, mobile media, anything that involves a digital component is what happens to the, our memory and archive of events? Is the scope of what we're looking at increasingly becoming smaller because our cultural shared memory is also becoming smaller? Like, I think about Windows 3.1, for example. I don't necessarily remember a whole lot about what was happening at that particular point, and I, you know, the documents that I wrote and the content that I created at that point are sort of lost in an archive that I'm never necessarily going to, to you know, regain. So how do you create media um, that relates to an ever-changing environment and an increasingly accelerated pace of, of innovation that will allow future generations to understand the context of where you came from. Especially when these are the artifacts, the physical artifacts that we're leaving behind, when increasingly much of what we do is like this. It's temporal, it's um, asynchronous, it, it's uh, digital, it's not necessarily meant to last. And not saying that it has to last, but what is our footprint? Um, and that kind of leads us a little bit to the city and a little bit to the work of, that's going on at OCAD and through the MEIC. Um, and one of the things, like increasingly, and as you know, Matt and Ben have discussed um, as well, is that networks and, um, and infrastructure and software are the, the, the sort of permeable and malleable layer between citizens and their environment um, in terms of how they interact with it and the stories that they create. Um, both from the vernacular sort of day-to-day -day reality as well as the projected reality of the future and the shared realities that we all sort of build up our social systems around. And our ritual becomes transformed into something that is about touching, into something that is about sort of storage or archive or what have you, um, or location. And so talking about storytelling a little bit, um, this is a project that was done through OCAD and uh, the Portage Network, which included the Banff New Media Institute and Concordia University. Um, it's a geolocative game that uses Bluetooth phones, and it, this one took place in, in Montreal on Mount Royal Park, um, using historical uh, stories and brought them to life. So you would engage and interact on the park, walking around, and thinking about historical events that had happened in that particular place. And Um, and also one thing about this, like how does this relate in terms of narrativity going back to our Inuit map when you're out in, you're in the world and what are the things, what are the cues, whether be they tactile, visual, sensorial, that are helping us to sort of understand where we're coming from and where we're going. Um, this is a project called the Wall of Sound. This is just a schematic diagram that talks a little bit about how it works. So you have your user that you connect via Bluetooth to a server that connects to um, uh, sort of the and instruments eventually and goes through voltage and amps. Um, and what that looks like is are these instruments here. So essentially you're walking around and um, you interact with the Bluetooth server either through bluejacking or through signing through um, um, like being notified or through actively uh, contributing to the project. And these instruments um, will then play for you. This is a glockenspiel and a xylophone and these are cowbells. And you can also not necessarily engage with it um, with the experience through your phone but also through a foot pedal if you so desire. And so this is a project that was done with the Mobile Experience Lab, um, and it's called Cicadas, and again, the little schematic of how it works. You have your mobile device, and there's EMFs that are in the air. Um, there's an EMF detector. It detects you that you're nearby via Bluetooth. Um, it can send a message to you if you want, or it'll then activate the little cicadas that are in the tree. And that's a demonstration of them using it, um, and as well, the, those are the little mylar cicadas down at the bottom. So you have, there's a park really close to OCAD that these things were full, completely filled with, uh, which was a really fun and sort of hilarious adventure. Um, and this is the last project that I'm going to show you. Um, this is something called Tentacles, and this was done with the Canadian Film Center New Media Lab, um, OCAD, and York University. And this is an iPhone application that was created for Nuit Blanche. 
And Nuit Blanche is a one-night art event um, that happens in Toronto. It's 12 hours, 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. And basically, a million and a half people descend upon the city, and there's about 450 exhibitions. So it's this really sort of insane uh, way to look at your city. Um, and so what this is, you download the application on your phone, and this is your, your squid. Um, and your whole purpose is to gain as much as many of these little, uh, these little things up at the top and throughout there. Those are, are called tentacles. And they're basically little pieces of food. Um, and so you have to, the whole point is to basically gain as many of these and grow as big as you possibly can. But this is projected on the side of a gallery um, for the entire night and a free application. And so what happens is that when you become, you get into proximity with this space, um, the, your squid interacts with other squids and you're fighting for these little tiny bits of food and you can sort of push people off and it's very sort of a visceral uh, sort of way of, um, of, of playing. Um, but when I think about these things, I think about the types of archetypes that have preceded them and I think about, you know, like what does this communicate in terms of our, our cultural ability, in terms of our technological capability, um, you know, is this how different from this is from the, um, the sort of nomadic eruptions on the, the steps that we saw with carpets where you have, you know, whatever's being uh, visualized or communicated that's completely embedded with, um, you know, iconography and information about that particular place. Um, and they also tend to, in terms of interaction, create a really interesting pocket of opportunity, you know, a little pocket between two people, whether you want to call that sacred space or a pocket or what have you. Um, but it's, creates a, a set of experiences that are intrinsically tied to, um, to the place where they occurred. And the last, um, I guess, sort of idea I want to talk about also goes back to, to Ursula Franklin. And I think when we think about synchronous and asynchronous experiences, um, you know, this particular piece is a very synchronous experience. You're working, at this with, you're working on this with other people at the same time. So you have a shared sense of when this is happening and where it fits in the sense of you know, human continuity. But some of the other projects happen on an asynchronous nature, where you put an input, you get an input back, but it doesn't necessarily jive. Or you're, in terms of a community, it's not happening um, all at the same time, so to speak. And so I wonder, when we talk about you know, looking at historical precedents and looking towards the future, is this does this sort of mean that all of our activities, like, are there new forms of activities and new forms of, uh, I guess, interactions, experiences, and engagements, as well as artifacts and infrastructure that are being built? And that's sort of maybe one example of a map that I saw in Prague that tells you how far you are from the Oriel Wall. And that's it. Uh, so I think what we'll do is um, we'll have uh, a few questions for Michelle, and then the four of us will sit at the special table there. Hi. It, it strikes me that the first half of what you do in a lot of these is, is anthropology before it becomes production, and mm -hmm. that normally in the past anthropologists don't get to make Tools basically, they bring a notebook or a camera, or whatever. But they're not—they're not manufacturing a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but that when you are getting into digital culture, you may actually have to build. I mean, I was thinking in terms of like emulators or things that would allow you to record the culture of the electronics that's going on for future generations. Is, is that something that you've thought about? I think so. I think. Um there's definitely like the interest in, in taking a bird's eye view to how things could potentially play out. But one of the things that I kind of find interesting about digital culture and the pervasiveness and the interconnectedness of it is that it happens in the wild. And so you become as much of an active participant in both the design and the interaction as anyone else. And of course, that subjectively colors you know what you're going to be um, looking at and how you're going to be looking at it. But it also changes the stakes a little bit. Is that? But what, what about the idea of? Um, electronic proxies for, for this researchers or something that would go out on your behalf? Yeah, I think that that actually as well, um, you know, because you can't necessarily be everywhere at once and you can't, you know, how, how many multiple slivers of identity do we all have that we could potentially want to play out? Um, yeah, and in some cases, I don't know, uh, Canada's a little bit hard with the adoption rates, um, so uh, although that's changing, um, having an emulator that did that for you would be extraordinarily helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much. I like your presentation. Sorry, I, sorry I mean, could you speak up? 
I have a specific question about the Greenland map mm -hmm. because I have it too. Then I, I'm a kind of surprised at how that one, you know, it has been distributed to the world. Because could you tell me where you get it? Sorry, sorry. Where you got the map? I mean, the wooden map of mm -hmm. Greenland. Where did you get it? Um, it was, where does it live now? It lives in a museum, and I can't exactly tell you which museum it lives in, um, but it was it, um, the internet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One last question for Michelle, no? Um, based on your experiences, how do you think we will be remembered? Based on sort of the the difference between having a, a vessel that carries this digital media, maybe for us, like that pile of cell phones that we saw, versus an artifact, which might be like the rug or some sort of art piece that's created today, or would it be a document of an event that occurred? Like, how do you how do you think we will be remembered? I know it's interesting, like because so much of where we place value and meaning, and even with these, you know, these artifacts are just, you know, they're they're one tiny pixel of like the entire picture of what people's experiences were were like. And um, what I would find really interesting is a way to archive experience. And I don't necessarily know if that means a tangible piece of something that you carry with you, um, you know, and you know gets buried in the earth. And I think in terms of what are future archaeologists, digital archaeologists, going to be doing, and how will they be coming back and looking at, uh, at the types of things we're making? Um, there's a part of me that loves the tactile and the physical, but like increasingly, it's important. But it's it's not. It's uh, it, there are hybrids. So I don't know if that answer. I don't know. <laughs> and I think that also sort of raises the question with digital archaeology: is sort of how do you sift through the noise to actually pick out something that's indicative of the human experience yeah. at X point in time. Exactly. Well, in the same way that current archaeologists, and I'm not saying like it's going to be you know it's totally this easy, but um, how many pottery shards do you have to go through in order to you know find something that's cohesive, or how much information do you have to piece together in order to build a story? So it's you know yeah. So does uh, the spectacular panel of people want to <laughs> gather at the dais? <laughs> Phase two. Phase two. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Uh, okay, so there, there are a couple of ways we could do this. I, I have some uh, questions that might kick off into a discussion, or you all might have questions for each other. I'll start with a question. <laughs> Or I guess more, more of a remark. Uh, it, it occurred to me just listening to all the three talks about a relationship between um, different and uh, just to generalize it, ways of sort of imagining or seeing the world. So if I, if I um, completely pigeonholed uh, Mark, I would say there's this kind of material representation of reality that is interpreted through these sensors and given to people in visualizations of various sorts that um, give them a sense of what the world is like. And then if I were to totally pigeonhole uh, Ben, I would say uh, Ben is doing similar sort of work, only the, the, uh, the representations of the material of the world sort of tip into the playful and the provocative uh, in, in, a, in a way that I think for Mark's work, um, again, just to pigeonhole, and I know it's much more complicated and subtle than that, is to find the ways in which people might uh, understand the world and use that information to shape and inform their behaviors in some sort of sense, and usually pointing in this direction of like, let's make the world a better, more habitable, more easy to breathe in space. And then I think of uh, your work, Michelle, or the work that you were sharing about the ways in which the world is, uh, world has been represented historically and through uh, different media that do travel in this way or are about travel, uh, but point in something in a different direction from mobile media in this sort of very everyday quotidian technology, cell phones kind of way that we think of it today. Uh, so that's my sort of, that's a very rough shoot from the hip liquor ho store hold up approach to synthesizing the ideas here. And I wondered if, um, if you guys have any comments about that in that regard. Or get yourself out of the pigeonhole. Yeah, these ones, you can adapt to. 
where Charlie Rose here, so just kind of speak with him. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, is, that, is that on? Yeah. I mean, I guess. It's on. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, it's definitely on. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and but I would make the comment that I think there's, they are all three. They're all three sides of. Um, so, in in my work, I guess I was focusing on the most, maybe sort of the darkest or the most interesting psychological ramifications or. New aesthetic experiences that um, resulting from these layers of ubiquitous mobile technologies, and uh, I guess that that's that's just part of the picture. Is uh, that's kind of where I'm drawn towards. But uh, I'm not at all saying that that's the way that everyone should live, and that there's the archiving and remembering, and getting the finding there are many more definitions to the truth about our environment. That's that that's all. That's kind of I didn't want to negate that in what I was showing. I guess sort of on that, the, this idea of archiving or trying to capture m more of a state. I mean, the projects I described were a bit more about a particular aspect of something as opposed to trying to capture everything that's going on in some sort of vain attempt to represent experience through a data feed of some kind. So I feel, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work like that, right, that tries to capture everything that's going on. And I don't quite know what I think about that. I mean, it, they always feel a little melancholy to me, like the ability to see or capture something new sort of makes you aware of the fact that you didn't record those other things that happened before, right? There's like something fundamentally sad about it or, or something. And, and so I don't know quite. So, so the work that, that I presented was much more about particular contexts or particular things and maybe less about aspiring to kind of capture, you know, the essence of something or, or life around you or something like that. And I'd agree with that. Um, and also um, with both of, of what you said. Um, and also around the notion of objects and systems of objects. Um, in terms of where they fit, how they, they are going forward. Um, um, <laughs> which is exactly when you want it to happen. Oh, I don't, actually, maybe this isn't on, so maybe it's just you floating. Oh, no, it is on. Okay, is that, oh, there we are. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I just bought myself 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I guess in terms of, um, you know, like, it is very much a sliver or a slice um, or a particular lens that you look at, at the culture through. Um, it's not just about, you know, like a historical record. It's also about, you know, the, the designing of and creation of, of new interactions and new ways to essentially look at um, where you're coming from and relating to the environment. So along those lines, I wonder if the, um, the ways in which we're representing the, the sort of geospatial world, the ways in which the, the landscape becomes an interface to interaction and to um, set thinking about and reconsidering the world around you. I, I'm wondering, uh, I guess there's this idea of the quantified self and the ways in which we represent ourselves and use it through, represent ourselves through data. And I'm wondering if we're thinking about the ways in which we will be remembered in a way, if there will be those artifacts left over uh, in 300 years where the, the equivalent of a tapestry is some kind of mattress for you know, who we were in that way and what that might what that might sort of look like. Like what would be the equivalent in 300 years of someone saying, well, here's how my landscape looks, um, which is obviously very different from the canonical explorer map that sort of maps the landscape in a way that we think of today as traditional. Uh, what that might look like as uh, as aggregates of data. So will perhaps um, the kinds of maps that people are making using Google Earth and you know these kinds of things become those artifacts those artifacts in the future. So I guess 
to be succinct, the, the, the question is, the maps that we understand today, which are the canonical, this is reality, fixed maps that I think most people uh, who are outside of the world that we sort of exist in now would look at those, look at these maps and the maps become essentially uh, mashups where the landscape disappears in the, in the traditional sense and it's more markers and collections of experience and moments and those sorts of things. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I th what I find interesting about um, looking at like canonical maps is the notion of power and control and uh, deciding where the borders go in terms of what does that mean in terms of displacement, what does that mean in terms of the collection of data that happens within that in terms of standards. And when you think about mashups, like there's, it's, it's sort of the exact opposite or the polar opposite in that it becomes this sort of uh, free-for-all in a lot of ways. You're using a canonical map, but you're, you're reestablishing your own sense of, of identity or purpose within that. Um, but how many millions of those are going to are, do exist now and are going to exist in the future? And um, I don't know. Like, there's also something about the fragility of them. Like, you know, you, ha you drop your your PC on the floor and or your laptop, and suddenly it's gone. Um, and there's no way to really regain it. And does cloud computing really provide a trust in terms of being able to go back and, and archive those again? And it, will it be the same interface? I don't know. But I think it's somewhere in in between. You know, like having something that's coming from top down and having something from bottom up. You know, I guess there, there were, uh, it really startled me. Um, the one thing I guess uh, I think is generally true that um, the sort of the work that we've been doing, I, th I think that um, one thing that, that Maybe not thinking about about designing for someone to look back and, and see what's going on 300 years from now, but I mean, take as an example like the the Framingham study. I remember reading a really beautiful New York Times paper about or a New York Times article about um, how people had used. This was a longitudinal study of a group in Framingham, Massachusetts, and it was originally designed uh, for one purpose, but then over time has supported a number of different studies. Right, so there's a kind of longitudinal. Thing that can happen when you this quantified self gets sort of pushed through, and I, I don't know how many of the systems we're designing pro would provide for that kind of longitudinal analysis over decades. Right? I mean, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, the other thing, though, I, I wonder if maybe we're a little too fixated on trying to design for this 300 years, and maybe it's good to engineer some forgetfulness into the mm -hmm. systems, like. You know, John Francois Blanchet here in the Information Studies Department does a lot of work about, you know, thinking about forgetting as something valuable in society and, mm -hmm. and in digital systems. They're not really designed to forget. So maybe, you know, maybe we should start to think about that as a positive value or not. You know, and I'd be interested in that if people could, uh, you know, the digital landfill or how you can come at something obliquely to, to sort of find out. So I remember a project a student was doing where they were looking at, um, you know, the robot dog, the Ibo, you know, how this, and as we're surrounded by kind of more <laughs> robot animals and creatures, they're recording us and they're, they're kind of having this intimate relationship with us and then they break and we throw them in landfill. And then, so maybe, who knows, there'll, kind of, there'll be a way to dredge that data and provide, that'll be kind of new artifacts that we find by looking at those, we find things in unlikely places, rather than trying to somehow capture something very specific and archive it, we kind of come at it obliquely and we'll find there'll be the, kind of the, the pottery, the equivalent of, of the time we're living in now. It's sort of, I mean, um, it, along those lines, the, uh, the tension that I think you referred to um, when you were sharing the work of your student who's doing the you, your flowing data, um, which is, not, I mean, I, I sort of use it and very interesting to sort of play with, but you do get that moment where you, you sort of tip into archival mode, like, I should record that. This, you know, th this is another line of experiences that I've been wondering about myself, that now that I have this, this mechanism and this uh, you know, set of techniques and instruments to record, like I should record that to the point where I think you know you tip into that thing where it's like you're not doing anything but recording stuff, in a sense, and you start losing that sense of you know I don't know if it's balance or just kind of um, uh, you, you very quickly could tip into a kind of obsessiveness where you can imagine someone uh, you know living in a room with newspapers painted on the windows so they don't get you know they're just focused on this one activity, and I'm wondering how much of um, it, 
is there a way in which in experiences like this perhaps where you do as a as a design principle think about the opportunities for losing things in a in a you know maybe um, in a constructive way so we know that you I don't know what it is I mean but you know as starting from that principle saying like either things aren't, aren't gonna, you know take all the all the fundamental aspects of what digital technology means to us uh, you know some um, you know, 60 years from since von Neumann, and saying we're actually going to re-engineer this so that you start things start falling off the ends a bit, or things actually are designed to move slower or slowly rather than quickly, and these kinds of things. And I'm wondering how much of that sort of starts inflecting into that kind of more material, embodied, you know, that the. the this is some of the craft stuff that I saw you sharing with us, that it was actually, you could see the hand in it, in a way, and that kind of human element, and that element of um, uh, personality and handmadeness, and you know, some of the stuff that I know that you do, besides OCAD kind of stuff. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, you know, to, to what degree might might uh, might we start tipping the the design sensibilities of things that are sort of about geospatial media? So that I mean, most of the stuff that I think we would you know agree is less interesting is the mobile media experience where you get the coupon when you walk by the Starbucks, or the mobile media experience where you do the augmented reality thing where you look up and it tells you where the uh, you know where a restaurant is or where your friends are. Like, when does it start tipping into things that? Um, are not the purely instrumental get you from A to B kinds of experience? I think it's when they become inherently personal, for one. Like, I, it's one sort of way to, to look at it. Um, and that's partly just around, like, the notion of what an object means to you. But what can you learn from it? Can you use a knife and have it communicate how to chop carrots? Can you, you know, in terms of, of mobile media or media that, you know, is... Um, is, is smart or enabled, or uh, something that tells you, you know, this is the path that my grandfather took when I was, you know, when he was a young kid and walked to school every day, and something that links to either your personal history or something that you're trying to accomplish, some skill that you're trying to, 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 you know, to achieve or whatnot. I don't know. Is that? That's period. <laughs> 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 okay, more of a, a proper question. Um, the a, a lot of the work that uh, that we saw this morning was showing ways in which uh, sensors are being used to uh, reflect upon uh, the real world or the world around us. And I'm wondering, uh, particularly in this idea of citizen science or public participation and data gathering and these kinds of things, uh, can that be interpreted? as a kind of vote of no confidence for those large systems that we once trusted not to fail, but perhaps are failing us, uh, partially failing us, and partially now we have the opportunity to actually do our own gathering of that information and sharing it in that kind of real-time way that, I guess, mobile media in part is allows. Well, I, would, I would say that we're just becoming more, um, just more sophisticated consumers of the, of, of with the idea that we're, what it, what a sensor is, I think people know know that, and the idea of a mashup versus a sensor that you deploy yourself, or a sensor that a school puts up versus a civic uh, or the government, and so there's room for all those things and how we navigate through uh, those uh, data coming from those sensors. I think one isn't going to necessarily you know, r remove another one. We just um, we can just uh, deal with m many different qualities of, of data source or and um, the tools to to navigate them will will be, be developed I think I think also it's it there's an interplay that can be had between sort of the sensing the sensor investments that are there by the so it's not necessarily a lack of con or a vote of no confidence it's that how do you maybe provide or augment those official sources right so um, you know, the, and, and to even, I mean, the, the, the air quality is a, is a nice example. I mean, Ben had mentioned, you know, that the official reports only give you averages. And part of the reason they only give you averages is because it's not quite clear what the health impacts are of spikes 
of various kinds, right? So even when in LA, if they, if they produce uh, sort of health alerts, right, it's based on 12-hour moving averages. And you know, so the EPA isn't even quite sure to a certain extent what, I mean, it's sort of a trade-off to get, to get these reported numbers, and the averaging is for a reason. But now if you can start to um, have much more refined measurements of day-to-day -day comings and goings, micro exposures, it could allow for epidemiological studies that are, you know, in sort of a different scale, right? A different, a different, um, a different kind of thing almost. And so, rather than having to deal in aggregates, you can deal with much finer, much finer granularity. So it doesn't have to be the collapse of, you know, a, a lack of confidence in sort of official whatever. It can be a, a marriage of, of the two in a way. Yes, audience. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it, it was only really in looking at um, all of your work together that I just started really thinking about this. That that all the kinds of um, the kinds of things that you're all concerned with that basically, in a way, have to do with um, ways to remind ourselves that we are in a place, uh, like a specific place. Uh, they're, they're ways to relocate us uh, wherever it is that we are and give that place uh, a kind of meaning. Um, and the thing, that's, the thing that's funny about it is, is that, um, that that role has been delegated really to m mobile media. Um, and in fact, like now the only place where we're nowhere is actually at home um, uh, or at work. Um, because those are the two locations where we're engaged in all the kinds of activities, all the kinds of computing and sensing and whatnot, but it's not located, actually. Um, and that the fact that there is no geospatial presence for, you know, whatever high double-digit percentage of all the information that's being generated, which is on PCs, is kind of weird. Um, I mean, and it's, you know, it's clearly where you know, the, you know, it's Twitter just announced their, you know, the, the geospatial API, you know, for tweets that'll be coming out, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just, it's interesting that the, that, that the, that the two places where people spend most of their time are the places that have been most ignored uh, in the collective of all work that's going on in this. Is it? I mean, not programmatically, but I, I just, I just wonder if that's of interest in, in terms of thinking about where to go next. Yeah, I mean, I think that's when I was talking about like heterogeneity in, in networks and, you know, a, a few, I mean, 10 years, 15 years ago, we were talking about virtual reality and, you know, traveling without moving. And my worry is that, um, and uh, is that if we're, so many of us are living life through the same interface, we're moving, but we're not traveling, you know, we're not, we're kind of, it's, we're, everything is, is mediated in the same way. And so, although, um, one has to admire, you know, it's a, it's it's a, it's great that the things like the the iPhone is is the portable PC, but um, I think there there is room for many other kind of bespoke hybrid experiences as well, so that uh, it doesn't become everywhere is the same. Um, Michelle, you talked about the, the uh, bay leaf being passed around, and I mean, is there any kind of um, work that you've seen where that uh, sort of, you know, uh, recreates that experience to some extent where it's more of a community, uh, you know, in, where people are more engaged with each other as opposed to being engaged with their uh, digital interface? Yes and no, I, but I think a lot of it has to do with digital interfaces um, from passing, sort of, you know, throwing the ball from one place to another, passing the leaf from one person to another. It's like the telephone game that Kevin talked about and what's the bay leaf is not necessarily the physical thing, it's, it's a piece of information that goes from one person to another, so, um, but I don't know of anything that's, uh, like, that would be in the physical world or something that would track that in the physical world at this point, I don't know. Like, or, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just in terms of, of sort of... Um, Chapstick <laughs> eruption. Sorry. Thanks. Um, being being uh, 
you know, um, sort of uh, facilitating positive social um, activities as, as uh, you know, opposed to just simply um, interacting, you know, remotely, basically. Uh, are you aware of anything that is, you know, sort of, that sort of does that? Um, Any of you? Yeah. <laughs> right, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm I saying, I'm saying in the context of, of mobile media, you know. Uh, um, there, oh, I guess in mobile media, I'm trying to think. There's a campaign that was launched, I guess, about two years ago. I don't know if it happens here or not, but it's called Pay It Backward. And what you do is you go to a particular coffee shop. It's like Starbucks. It's called Second Cup. And you buy the person behind you a, piece, a cup of coffee. And there's also a mobile component to that where you can log in, and it's not necessarily that you're transferring data, like you're you're not you know sending somebody a cup of coffee, you're physically buying it, but there's a way to record that information that happens with your phone. So I don't know if that sort of speaks to it a little bit. I can maybe add this is a sort of self-centered response, but um, the, a couple of my friends at NYU and I have a, a we had a, a workshop that Nokia sponsored last summer, and one of the the byproducts of that was a project. I, had the slide, but I didn't talk about it. Uh, using recycled mobile phones in support of urban gardening, and so people would hand a phone, which is now, which is just basically junk at, after first generation passed. And that phone would have some impromptu sensors that would help a new urban gardener figure out what plants would be suitable for their environment. So it'll take pictures of things to decide what the light levels are. Um, there's sort of crude temperature measurements. There's some some sound that you can see. Are you near a freeway or not? Um, and and that, that information then could then, once the plants start to grow, be used, the, the phones can upload pictures of the plants and various, you know, sort of gardening, gardening experts can provide advice. And then once you're no longer a, a, a new gardening person, you pass that on to somebody else, right? And you sort of keep that going. And it's all in the context of these recycled phones, which don't really amount to much uh, at this point. Can we, we have three minutes. Can we do one more question? Hello. I was interested in hearing, uh, watching about your, your project and hearing um, the talks. The one thing that maybe will be interesting thinking is how this technology will affect um, developmental psychology and behavior. Because very often, we uh, research and designer, we think about the adult mind and how adult people will use this technology. And I recent, recently had, um, I uh, was present to a um, presentation that was talking about how generations are changing, and especially in the relationship between teenager and technology, and specifically the use of mobile media, how it became central to their life. And they were um, pointing out how, for example, they uh, cannot live without being connected. Uh, they need to be connected to their peers 24 hours a day, and they need to be multitasking constantly because they have this idea that, first of all, living outside the network means is a social debt, and second, that if they focus on something, then they lose everything else that is going on. And that is affecting the mind of this new generation. And I, know, I think this is a very interesting uh, aspect of mobile media, and I was wondering if you had um, a comment about this or something to say of somebody could predict, you know, no, where the ways if it will become... I mean, I, I, in the, the observation that uh, I think, you know, the young uh, people who have grown up with um, mobile phones, they, they, can, they seem to be able to handle multitasking with many windows into many different virtual worlds, whereas someone who uh, this development has, uh, someone who hasn't grown up with it, it's much more overwhelming, I think. I th but I also think how, um, d I, I'm interested in what are the implications of so many virtual spaces filling our minds as well. So we, we live in, you know, we, we live in a set number of physical spaces from, you know, from home, from the city, whatever, but when we think of things like um, text messaging, our iTunes music library, our email inbox, they're all virtual spaces. And what are the implications of so many of these 
uh, as well as wireless networks filling the world, there are these virtual spaces filling our minds. So what are, what are the implications of that? I don't know. I think it's really it's, it's very interesting. Because this study that was presented to us seems to suggest that they actually, although this new generation is able to multitask, they are not able to um, engage in the kind of deep um, and focused attention on a lot of subjects. So they do multitask, but they do it very superficially. So I'm, I'm wondering you know, what will, how this will affect our culture in the future. This is um, a little related, um, not necessarily to how it will affect our culture, but there was a study that was recently done at the University of Toronto by a really brilliant woman named Rhonda McEwen, and she looked um, over the course of a year at how immigrant uh, students over their first and second years at university were using mobile phones. And she's really interested in particularly how youth use it. Um, and what she found uh, through her study was coming to Canada um, from other places is a, to use a cell or a mobile is a little bit different. Um, it's a pretty constrained environment. There's only three telcos, rates are really high, et cetera. And what she found was that over the first three or four months that they were there, their behaviors changed drastically based on what they had been used to doing at, in wherever they'd come from and with the rates and the plans that they were used to using and how that changed when they came to Canada and they would get you know, several hundred dollar phone bills for sending text messages to one another. So it's interesting to think also about those constraints and how they affect you in, in that particular context. And like how does that you know, affect how you're going to be using something in the future? Do you become more particular about you know, the types of data or the types of information that you're, you're communicating. Um, okay, I'd like to thank Mark, Ben, and Michelle for their So we have a, we have a one hour break for lunch. Um, then we come back for mobile games. Thanks, you guys. And if you're not familiar with campus and you need to um, find something to eat, there's three options. Um, one is just to go upstairs. There's a cafe and they have some sandwiches. There's more various options if you just go straight out of the building and you, you go under this large brown building with the, with, um, which is called